Right, thanks, thanks for coming, folks. Um, so, yeah, we're here to talk about successful delivery using low-code tools. So we'll just start with a couple of introductions. So I'm Gary, uh, I'm a product owner. I've been with the EE network for about four years. This is Graham, he's our delivery lead. Uh, he's been the network for about six years. So since the start of this year, we've been working on a project, a kind of a, a project that sits across EE and, and DPS, the HMRC um, uh, clients. Um, and we're gonna talk through a bit about what, what we've been involved in. Um, and some learnings that we've, we've encountered along the way. Um, just to introduce the wider team, we're fortunate to work with um, a number of folks from the EE Evolve program. So um, Dharam and Diogo are, are in the room at the moment. They're, they're currently with us in the team. Previously, we've had Sonny, Darren, and Liam with us. Um, interestingly, one of the sort of side objectives, side benefits of this piece of work is it's, it's given people on the Evolve program the opportunity to understand a bit more about EE as a business and how it interacts with its clients. Um, for anyone not aware of, about Evolve, it's EE's sort of junior, junior, junior developer program to sort of help help developers come on from the early stages of their career. Um, so objectives of this talk. So this is low code and COTS products, kind of a hot a hot topic right now. Um, and we're in a room here with a bunch of software development professionals. So I think a lot of people might have strong opinions um, about the rights or wrongs of, of using low-code tools, COTS products um, from a software development perspective. And so, you know, we're, we, Graham and I, we, we don't have particularly strong opinions either way on this, but the perspective we're taking for this talk is sometimes you might be in a position where decisions been made. We're going to build some capability using some low-code tools. Um, and maybe the, the train has left the station. And so uh, in that context, you might encounter some challenges and some things that you need to do uh, and some ways that you need to adapt and learn. And so if we can share a few of those learnings with you and it helps um, on your future work, then all well and good. So that, that's really what we're hoping to get across here. Um, some context about the client engagement. So. I'm sure most of you will know about uh, DPS. So it's data, data platform services. It's the essentially one of the largest uh, divisions within HMRC's IT um, organization, responsible for most but not all of the sort of data storage, data um, extraction, processing, exploitation components within HMRC. So it's it's a big important division within the overall HMRC IT estate. It is, uh, it is also Equal Expert's biggest engagement. So the numbers fluctuate, but broadly about 300 associates active at any one time. Um, dozens of teams um, across five what, what HMRC calls pods. A pod is product-oriented delivery. Really a kind of a collection, a grouping of teams working on specific areas of functionality. Um, that's sort of less important in terms of what we're doing here. What is important is the number of SOWs. So a SOW is a statement of work for one thing that EE commits to deliver on behalf of the client. Um, they vary in length and complexity. Some are very simple, small piece of work for a month for two or three associates. Others are really complex, 12 months, um, multiple teams, um, multiple outcomes. Um, so lot, lots of kind of different uh, nuances and complexity. And EE processes way, uh, way more than 200 or so SOWs per year. So highly complex, lots of back and forth, um, lots of exposure for EE. So important to get these documents and these processes right. Um, so really the goals of our piece of work. So, it's a, so we joined, Graham and I joined the team at the beginning of this year. And we had sort of really three goals, three goals as a team. One is around, one was around sort of improving the, the quality and the consistency of the SOWs. So if you imagine you've got, like I say, 200 of these documents being produced a year across dozens of teams, um, dozens of delivery leads, um, the potential for each one of those to say the same thing but slightly differently um, is, is quite high. And if you bear in mind that this is a, a legal commitment that Equal Experts is making to the client to deliver a thing, often for a fixed price with defined outcomes over a fixed time period, you know, we need to ensure that 
the language is right, the same things are described in the same way. And that's also important for the client as well, because they need to understand exactly what they're buying. Um, the next goal is around returning sales more quickly to DPS. So DPS uh, has its own internal customers. So these are other teams within HMRC who come to DPS and say, I need this outcome, build me this thing. DPS has internal SLAs it needs to meet around the length of time it takes to come back to its customers internally. And part of that is the time it takes for suppliers such as EE to turn around their piece. So we need to play our part in helping DPS to meet its goals. Um, there are also contractual penalties um, if, if we don't turn around sales within uh, the SLA, which, which we have, which is 15 days. Um, sounds like a long time, but actually goes really quickly when you need to have conversations and you need to um, get teams together, you need to work across different teams, you need to go back to the client to understand more. So lot, you know, time goes quickly. Um, and, the, and the final goal really is around reducing the manual overhead. So an awful lot of effort goes into producing these documents. Lots of chasing, lots of templates that need to be filled in, um, uh, corralling people. So um, the third goal that we had, which really sort of helped with the second one as well, is reducing that manual overhead significantly. Um, so looking at through the, the sort of the people process technology lens, um, there's really three, starting with people, there's really three, three main groups of people involved. Um, we have the delivery leads themselves, obviously they're working with their teams, they're probably delivering some existing piece of work already and then DPS comes along and says, please impact assess this new piece of work. So they have to run around, they have to work with their teams and maybe with architects across the client to understand what's it going to take to deliver the new outcomes that have been requested. Um, there's engagement support, so engagement support are really the front door to the client they receive incoming emails, they route them to the right teams, they make sure people understand which forms they need to fill in, they collect it all back together, they send it to engagement managers for approval. So they, they, they do a lot of the heavy lifting and keep it, everyone on the straight and narrow. And then the final group of people involved in this process is um, engagement managers. So they are responsible for the sort of overall commercial relationship between EE and the clients. They have to review each sound document as it goes through the process. So there's 200 of these a year, so that's a lot of documents to read. They have to read the costs, understand the resources, um, and so a lot of effort from their perspective. Um, so they're the three main groups involved. I'm going to hand over to Graeme, who's going to sort of take us a bit kind of through the process and the technology. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I start, I can just raise your hand if you've implemented a COT solution or a low-code solution for an actual client. Has anybody used them? So one, really? apart from the two that are actually actively on this project, <laughs> which don't count. So it's interesting. So um, yeah, Gary and I are here today, not as experts. We've worked on one low-code implementation for the past five months. Um, so by no means experts, but we think we have learned quite a lot along the way. And we're going to share some of that with you today. Um, we're just going to share some observations. Um, so these are based on an implementation that we've done, um, obviously for, for DPS HMRC, uh, using Zapier, which is a automation tool, and Airtable, which is, I think it's called a collaboration tool. It's a half spreadsheet, half database. Um, but what we try to do is pick some examples that are sort of agnostic of those technologies. So if people have other implementations or other technology solutions for low code, that some of these examples will be applicable. Before we look into those sort of technologies, just a, a, an overview of what the implementation actually was. So as Gary alluded to, um, it's uh, all around the SAO document, this uh, statement of work, and it starts off with uh, HMRC sending um, EE, what's known as a DNR, a delivery and requirements document. Uh, this would go to engagement support, where Lucy used to work. Uh, she would uh, look, look at these documents and actually transpose that information, cut and paste information from a Word document into Airtable, also at the same time creating a Trello ticket that was used to track this. In parallel, the delivery leads would then find out about this and would create a, a, um, a spreadsheet of resources and a resource profile, and then would go off and create a Word document based normally on the Word document they'd created a few weeks ago or find one from somewhere else. But it's quite a disjointed process 
and um, there wasn't any sort of connection between the two. That would then email back to the SAO uh, mailbox, then more um, manual changing of this, this sort of contractual SAO document take place. More information would be cut and pasted into, into Airtable uh, and Trello would also be updated. But the, the Trello bit was really just for the engagement managers when Nathan, Nathan was working. Uh, the DLs didn't really get involved in that process. Um, so overall, it was sort of a disjointed, limited visibility from the end to end. Uh, so very manual, very error prone. So along came automation. Um, and hopefully this diagram looks very similar, slightly more complex, but lots less human uh, effort involved and lots, uh, lot less cut and pasting. So this is a like, high level overview of the automation. So again, it's still started by HMRC, sending a DNA document into the engagement support mailbox. This time is an interface on top of uh, Airtable. So there's only specific information that we want to go into Airtable and it guides the, the user through which information is stored in that Airtable. Um, similarly, when the DL gets notified, they just have to create the, the cost forecast sheet, uh, which is their profile of the, the resource on the, the project. Um, and again, instead of having to create a Word document, cut and paste in, there used to be sort of costs in two places, number of months in two places, and you, you definitely miss those as a DL yourself. Uh, so now it's just a, an interface, again, just asking for the specific information you need, and that gets stored into Airtable. So now all the information required to generate everything is now in Airtable. So we can automate using Zapier to actually generate that sound document. Uh, we can generate versions of the sound document without anybody cutting and pasting. It's just all automated through the process. Uh, we've integrated Slack as well, so everybody gets messages, so the DLs, the EMs, and the engagement support team can see where a SAO is, what state it's at, assign it to a certain team to do the certain thing. And now you can see we've, we've, got, we've removed the need for Trello, so Airtable supports a Kanban view, so we've got a Kanban view within Airtable. So everything is now contained in the one place, um, and so much more visibility, less human cutting and pasting, increased quality, increased time. So that's what we did. What do we learn? So this section is just about some of the insights that we've learned about using a low-code solution. Um, so you should just treat your low-code implementation at a certain level as you would any other software delivery. <coughs> and one good example here is we've got a, a reference table that we store with an air table, which is basically like an environment file. So you can see here we've got two environments, test and prod. We'll come on to environment slightly later. Um, but what we can do now is store various attributes for various environments in the one place, so we're no longer hard coding. When you do automations and low code, it's, 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 there's drop downs, so it's, it sort of guides you to do hard coded things, but actually stepping back, you can, you can uh, step back and actually use references. So we've got lots here, so we've got things from, from Airtable, from Google Drives, Google Spreadsheets, Slack, emails, anything, these are actually Depending on the type of SAO, we've got certain text that we automatically add to the SAO. So we've got all that controlled within uh, Airtable itself, and we can read those. So that's, <laughs> that's a little excerpt on the right-hand side is, is how uh, the automation looks. And this is a standard pattern that basically you start an automation from a trigger. So this is a change of status. We then check in that particular automation if the status is the one we want to act on. And if it is, so that third step is the step we're doing all our automations, which is basically reading this data into, um, into your, your workspace. So we'd pass prod or test, and then all those attributes are available for all your lower steps. So you're not hard coding them, and obviously you can, you can change them, and the dynamic change. So that's been really useful. Building on top of that premise is that we, what we do is um, embrace reference IDs. Again, low code sort of lends itself to, to drop downs and using names and, and variables, and it looks, it looks fine, and you can did the, the work. But actually stepping back, it's much more efficient and effective if you actually use reference IDs as opposed to the actual names. Um, often hidden in plain sight, so you can see here from uh, Google, you've got the, the actual workbook ID is based on the URL, it's all the worksheet ID. Uh, similarly for, for Airtable itself, you've got the name of the, the actual base ID, the table ID, and the view ID. And they're really obvious, so you can read the URLs and actually get that information out. Similarly, once you've got the information in Airtable, you can then build back the URL, so you can do it both ways. Um, Slack is slightly more difficult to find, but it's there, and it's worth finding, because again, it makes it agnostic. So when people want to change the table name or change the Slack channel name, you can do that to your heart's content, and the automations still work. And again, we put these in the reference table, so these are all referenceable. Um, so it's just a, a, a pattern that we've used that seems really useful. Um, 
we've got an overall mantra within the sort of development is trying to keep our automations as small and simple as possible. And so there's a couple of methods we use here. Uh, this is just, these, these are actually automations, that's four separate automations. This is just trying to visualize that this is just one thing and it basically gets a forecast and creates a sound document. It's quite easy, we could put that into one automation. Um, the trouble is with automations, they don't handle logic very well. And we always get the premise of, oh, that's really good, but it'd be even better if you could just do this or if you can just do that. And you soon find that your automations get bloated. You have lots of paths. If you have if statements, you can't bring them back together, so you have to branch off. And it gets very complex and very bloated very quickly. So what we're trying to do here is, is separation of concerns. So we just have one automation that just reads the forecast data, and that's all it does. And it sets its status at the end to create a forecast extract. Then the next automation comes along and looks for that status, and will then start its process, do its bit, which in the case is create forecast extract, and then set its status. And so basically separating those concerns uh, means we've got smaller uh, automations, much easier to manage, much easier to follow. Um, an extra benefit of that is that we can restart the process. So if you want to generate a SAO and you haven't changed the forecast, you just change your, your textual content, you can actually just restart it at that create SAO process and it generates the document without doing the first steps. If you have one big automation, you can't do that. Um, that's really, really useful for us. One significant downside, and it didn't affect us, but it could affect, is that you've got an overhead there of waiting for the trigger. So you've probably got an average of 30 seconds waiting for the trigger to fire. So you've got an overhead there of a minute and a half. We're generating sound documents that you do once a week, once a month. It's, it's a small overhead and it's definitely worth us doing that, but you've got to bear that in mind for other automations where that overhead is possibly too much. Specifically on Zapier, they have introduced sub zaps recently. So that may be a better solution, but when we started this four months ago, they didn't exist. Zapier has sort of developed quite a lot in the four or five months we've been working with it. Uh, so it's getting better, but there's certainly uh, still room for improvement. Uh, sticking with statuses, but again, this, this is still with the mantra to keep things as small and as compact as possible in terms of your automations. This is doing it in parallel. So again, what we've got here is this is, a, this is the automations. There are three different automations uh, across the Kanban table, and this is looking at status. So we've got the first example is some simple changes. So change of status to this uh, impact in progress. We're just updating the, the date, just to stamp it to say it right in this column. Sometimes we assign it to somebody different, so we'll just do that one basic update. So we've kept those three chains of status in one zap, quite small. Um, can't really read that one, but the one in the middle is around where we return the, the, the SAO back to DPS. So we do lots of things. We, we create different uh, documents. We create a spreadsheet. We do lots of things. So we separated that zap logic into a, a separate zap, so we're not bloating this one here. And then thirdly, at the end, it's something we do for every change of status, we send a Slack message. Now, we could just do a Slack message, Slack message, Slack message, but that's not great because you're, you're getting it bloated. So what we do is all these are kicked off in parallel. This will fire if any of those three statuses are, are, are active. The middle one fires if it's just that ch uh, send back to DPS. And the third one fires every time, sending a Slack message. But you can do that all in parallel. And then again, it just keeps your, your size of the automations. Um, manageable. Finally, the deployment process. Uh, this is the single biggest issue we've had using low code, no code. Um, certainly with, with, between Zapier and Airtable, we haven't found a satisfactory way of deploying code to production. Um, it's manual, it's cumbersome, and it's definitely error prone. Um, what we started off at the very start, we had a dev test and prod environment. We, within weeks, dropped dev, because it's just too much of a manual overhead trying to maintain this extra environment. Um, similarly, or more so in, in prod, there's, there's certain sort of dashboards and interfaces. We only maintain those in prod. Again, the overhead of trying to sync that, that logic and that information uh, into test is just too much of an overhead. Uh, so we just do that directly in pod. We do do spikes and, and work out small bits of functionality on dashboards and interfaces in test but ultimately we do that in prod. So that leaves the test environment purely for the, the, the more complex uh, Zapier uh, workflows. And the process is basically, as we change things in test, we will document that in a Google Doc uh, and ultimately play back that doc in prod. There's no automation. You can cut and paste. There's no automated deployment. <laughs> cut and paste the zaps. You still have to manually run every automation in production manually. 
When you run it in production manually, you're running against production data. If your automation deletes a record, you're deleting a record in prod. If you update it, you update it in prod. It's, it's just difficult. Um, what we do, we have a, a nicely, because he is our internal client, we have a known SAO 6666, uh, which we both spin up and run. When you do an deployment, you run your deployment against that SAO. Against that, that so. so if you delete the SAO, it del deletes that one. And um, obviously the team are aware of this, this internal 666. We have tripped up once. There is, there is a report that goes out to DPS, um, which is HMRC, which shows their cycle time where we up to in the 15 day SLA and that 666 has appeared in that report <laughs> once. It wasn't great, it wasn't the end of the world, but it wasn't great. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that we're gonna spend a bit more time with, but it is just the, the biggest, strangest thing in terms of deployment. It's just, it's not like any other software development. It's, it's the big thing that's lacking. There's a couple of things we can look at. We, we, we can spin up the data and spin it down a bit better than we're doing it now. Possibly the biggest thing we might do, but probably not for this implementation, the other is probably too much, is to actually mark records, or test records internally in the database. And then when we're doing interfaces and reports, et cetera, we can uh, make sure that they're excluded from any sort of interfaces. But the overhead of doing that in all the, the automations is, is not insignificant. I say for this use case, it's probably not worth it, uh, but certainly for, for other client uh, implementations, it may well be worth it. Hopefully that's going to be a little bit of insight into um, the world of automation, the world of, of Zapier. There's a few others just very quickly before I hand back over to Gary. So just a few gotchas. Uh, there is issues with, <coughs> this is specifically for, for Zapier now, our implementation. Um, in terms of when it's looping, it doesn't loop great. Sometimes it goes a bit, a bit awry. So we have at least in one, if not lots of places, looking at Diogo and Darren doing the development, uh, had to just put sleeps and waits in certain code just to get it to work, just to get it to, to be uh, repeatable, which, which isn't great and doesn't sort of give you a massive amount of confidence. Uh, functionality can stop working. One significant one in uh, our integration with, with Gmail, we could nicely send an attachment of a, 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 a Google, uh, not Google, uh, an Excel spreadsheet and a, a Word document. About two and a half months ago, it actually stopped working. We got in touch with them and said, oh yeah, it stopped working. And to this day, they're still looking to fix it. But that's another sort of highlight is that that Zapier we raise it with, it's Google who they have to basically work with and liaise with to get that fixed from their end. Luckily, as of last week, we found a workaround, but it's out of anybody's control in terms of the team, in terms of what you get. Um, similarly, functions can be deprecated. So overnight, just something can, can be marked as deprecated. Again, we've been lucky that there's always been replacement functionality or later versions, but again, using COTS solutions, it's not guaranteed that what you're using today will be available tomorrow. Interesting ones, beta functions. This is again in Zapier. Mainly API low-level integration, so our low-level integration with, with Airtable itself, and low-level integration with uh, Google Sheets is uh, uh, API level, and they nicely mark that as beta. We think it's just a get-out-of-jail-free card, and I sort of understand it because they can't guarantee the low-level implementation of, of Gmail or, or Google Sheets from Zapier's point of view is not going to change when they do a new deployment. So there's no guarantee that when you're using those low-level functions, which you have to use for deletes and certain other function that isn't there out of the box, um, is not guaranteed. And finally, an interesting one is, is, is free. Free, that's really good. Uh, so this obviously pay, pay a monthly subscription for, for Zapier, uh, and recently some of their features that we use have been marked as free, which is nice. Not all of them. The ones that don't, we think are gonna to go to premium, and we're gonna have to pay more for them. So again, it's that, that thing about out, outside of our control in terms of, of what we pay and what functionality we can actually get. So that's some of the negatives overall. I mean, it's been a really, really interesting project. I think we've come far. I'll hand back to Gary to close. Oh. Good news about that last one is I think it's still Nathan's credit card that's attached <laughs> to a lot of our uh, a lot of our accounts. So we're fine with that. Um, so I've, I've got about five minutes left. So just to wrap up quickly. Um, so yeah, we've overcome a lot of kind of hurdles and challenges along the way, but we've delivered what we think are some good results. So. Since the beginning of March, when we put the first version of this automation through, to date we've processed 110 statements of work. Um, we broadly think time saving has been about an hour to two hours for each one of those sales. So that's 220 hours saved, um, or over 25 working days. Um, over and above that, as I mentioned at the start, it's not only about the time saving, it's about the quality and the consistency of the documents. So all of those sales now, describe the same things in the same way. So if it's a velocity sound, 
um, and we're a lead pod, it's described in the same way. So we're protecting EE and the client knows exactly what they're buying. Um, we've had some good feedback from people internally, people within EE. So uh, we've got Lucy <laughs> sitting over here um, who said, this is beyond brilliant. Thank you, Lucy. It's uh, 10 pounds in the post. Um, so Lucy's in the engagement support team. So as mentioned, they do a lot of the, the processing, making sure everyone does their job at the right time. Sarah's a delivery lead, it's so easy now. And Bert's not in the room, but he's another delivery lead. So um, we've saved a lot of time, we think. We've improved the quality and the consistency and we've got some great feedback from users. So what, what's, what's not to love as a, a software development professional? Um, so just some final thoughts. Um, so if you were at the start of a project and you're thinking about technology solutions and how should we deliver the outcomes we need, you might do a pros and cons list of, of, of a low-code tool or a COTS product, and you'll probably end up with a long list of cons, and you might end up with two or three pros, but they're not all equal. So some of those pros massively outweigh a number of the cons. So we have been able to iterate more quickly with less development resource. So at any given time in the team, I think we've had two developers. Um, Graham and I are not developers, but we're able to build production functionality, test it and get it into deployment um, and then save our valuable development resource for the really complicated things where the COTS product doesn't actually do what we need out of the box. So we think that's really valuable. Um, we've also been able to crowdsource a number of um, kind of improvements and pieces of functionality with people outside the team. So we've had people who are not in our team directly, but they've gone, oh, I'll, I'll go and build a little um, dashboard for that, or I've got an idea for how this, this piece could work better. And Brilliant, they can go and self-serve as long as we bring it through our test environment and make sure it doesn't break anything, that can work. Um, and as, as Graham has kind of covered earlier, a lot of the challenges, there are challenges, but they can, they can be overcome. So it, it is doable. Um, and with that, I think I've finished with about two minutes to spare. Yeah. 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 Yeah.